there's that like little doubt, right? Like there's already imposter syndrome. I don't feel like I know anything. Maybe he's right. That's like that, like, ooh, that like insidious sliver that someone plants in your brain. And you're like, I already didn't feel like I was supposed to be here. Maybe I'm really not. Hey, I'm Andrew Kaplan. Welcome to the Delivering Value podcast. In this show, I chat with some of my SaaS heroes, people who I look up to, people who work on and around cross-functional growth teams to hear their story, to explore their career, and hear about some of the toughest moments that they encounter along the way. My guest today is incredible. It is Sarah Stockdale. She's the founder of Grow Class, which is an award-winning growth marketing certification and community for both founders and marketers. And prior to Growth Class, Sarah led growth teams at Tilt, which was acquired by Airbnb and at Wave, which was acquired by H&R Block. And Sarah is also a content creator. She's the host of the Growth Effect podcast and also an author of the popular millennial newsletter called We Need to Talk About This. My conversation with Sarah explored her childhood, which was spent in ice skating rinks and working in grocery stores. We talked about her journey into tech, and we explored some of the most challenging moments that she's encountered along the way. I loved her story. I think you're going to love it too. Let's go ahead and jump right into the episode. Well, where I wanted to start today is if you could share a little bit more about where you're recording from. Yeah. So I'm recording from the Flying Squirrel Motorcycle Club, <laughs> which is a motorcycle club I joined a couple of months ago when my co-working space didn't work out. It just wasn't a really great fit. And I was at a coffee shop down the street from my house that happens to be also a motorcycle club and repair shop. And I was just chatting with the owner, who's a lovely guy. And he mentioned that the Wi-Fi is better in the members lounge. And I was like, tell me more about this members lounge. What's going on? He was like, hold, hold on a second. Here. Just to go back, there's a coffee shop that has a motorcycle repair shop attached to it? Yes. And they are building a barber shop as well. And yeah, so he brought me back here. Let me work here for the day. It's so cool. Everyone is so lovely. And I was like, I don't have a motorcycle, but <laughs> can I join? And Colin was gracious enough to let me join. And so now I work out of a motorcycle club members lounge and everyone is the nicest. And are there other people that work tech remote jobs that are working out of the motorcycle club? Not tech. The one guy who's here with me now is a pretty sure a medical doctor who works on brain surgery devices. And he also has a motorcycle. So he's working out of here today. But no, I think I'm the only tech person here. That's super cool. And where is the club? It's in the east end of Toronto. It's just down the street, literally at the bottom of the street that I live on. So it could not be more perfect. And is this where you're from originally? No, I grew up in a really small town of about 3,000 people called Dorchester, Ontario, which is nowhere that anyone really needs to go. There's like two stoplights. So I grew up in a really small town, a lot of farm folks. There were um, ATVs and tractors in our high school parking lot. So moved here for grad school and stayed, became a city person very slowly, but I'm a small town person at heart. And so what was like growing up in the small town? Tell us a little bit more about what your childhood was like. And I mean, you started to mention a little bit about the town and the tractors and the ATVs and stuff, but tell us a little bit more about what you were into growing up. I loved growing up in a small town. There are a lot of things now that I care about politically that maybe weren't necessarily aligned with some of the parts of my upbringing. But yeah, I grew up in, in a tiny little town, went to school with the same people all the way through. We had about 400 people at our high school and it was really close knit, you know, gossipy. I worked at the local grocery store. I knew like everything about everyone and I knew everyone who came in. So it was really social. It was very much a village. And I grew up with wonderful people that I'm still friends with. Like I know a lot of people in their mid thirties aren't close with the people they went to high school with. I love very much love my friends from high school. They're wonderful humans. And yeah, I was a competitive figure skater growing up. So I spent a lot of time at the local arena and in the you know arenas and surrounding areas training. Definitely wasn't good enough to head to the Olympics or anything like that, but spent a lot of my time on the ice. Super fun. And if we were to meet one of your wonderful humans that you're still in touch with today, how would they have described the high school version of you? Oh my God, I was probably so annoying. I did the morning announcements. I was like the vice president of the student council. I have student leadership energy and it was like 10X when I was in high school. So yeah, I was a geeky kid on the student leadership side. I was very much forced into taking a lot of STEM 
courses just because we didn't have enough academic courses for me to get into university if I didn't. So my friends were very, very smart in STEM. I was not. I did my best. But we were also big partiers. So we like, you know, small town. We had big bonfires. We'd ATV out into the middle of a field and drink on the weekends and then camp and sleep there overnight. So I kind of bridged those two, you know, vice president of the the student council plus drinking at the bonfire on the weekends. And where does that come from? You mentioned you were in a few different student leadership roles. Where did the urge to do that come from? I think I've always been like in any kind of situation, like socially and politically engaged. And so whether or not that's school or now being a little bit activisty and engaged in my personal life, I've always cared about how the structure of things happens, how communities are built and the decisions that are made that impact and affect other people. And also, I think I just, I liked the social part of it when I was growing up. I wasn't a very good athlete outside of skating. So I was finding kind of other communities to belong in. And in a school so small, there's not much else going on. And were your parents or other family members involved in other leadership positions? So my parents are very civically minded. My mom growing up was a social worker and my dad was a a firefighter. So just very kind of involved in the community people and very involved in politics and government because it it affected them a lot. And just a lot of kind of progressive people around me because of the professions that my parents had. And so you've obviously gone on to start your own business. Did that itch start at a young age? Like, were you one of those kids that in addition to doing the morning announcements and figure skating, did you also have all these businesses that you were growing and trying and experimenting with? No? No, not at all. Entrepreneurs have all these cool, like I was an entrepreneur from a little kid. I didn't know anyone who owned a business. My parents both were very like, work for the government, have a pension, safety, security, saving. They were divorced when I was young, so we didn't have a ton of money. And my mom could calculate the cost of what was in a shopping cart before we got to the checkout. It was never about making money. It was always about saving and having security and safety. So I grew up in a very risk-averse environment. And I worked really hard, but never thought that I could work for myself. So I worked at the local grocery store growing up. And like calculating how much I worked while I was in high school, I had a a 40-hour-a-week job. Well, I was in high school. In high school, in addition to your schoolwork? Yeah, like I worked 10 hours every Saturday, nine hours every Sunday, and then three to nine, like three or four days after school during the week after I stopped skating. So I was always working really hard, but I didn't have a framework of thinking that I could be making more or doing something more fun if I did it for myself. And I didn't actually get any exposure to that until my first startup job. And so tell us a little bit more about that transition. So you go from working at the grocery store in high school to graduating, going to university. Tell us about the first few steps into the world of SaaS, PLG, marketing. Yeah, it was kind of an accident. So I went to TMU, which is a university in Toronto for grad school in professional communications. I wanted to be a journalist, but in school they were like, you'll never make money. So I didn't didn't do it. You're actually the second person I've chatted with. Like the last two episodes I just recorded with Emma Stratton, who runs a copywriting called Punchy. And she told me the same thing. She was like, oh, I wanted to get into creative writing. And my parents told me, don't do that. There's no money there. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It was less my parents and more like my university professors were like, if you want to be poor forever, then be a journalist. And I was like, but I want to be a journalist. But I also, you know, I've been poor for a while and I prefer maybe to do something different than that. Yeah, I was going to go into PR. I got a full-time PR job at a downtown agency, went in to kind of have my last conversation and accept my offer. And a friend of mine who worked there who got me the interview was cleaning out a closet. And I'm like, not above cleaning out closets, but I was like, hey, do you do this a lot? Like, is this the majority of your job is like doing this stuff? And she was like, I kind of just do whatever they tell me to do. And at the same time, I'd been having conversations with a startup, which like, in whatever it was, like 2011, it wasn't cool to work at a startup. So in my head, it was like an accounting software company. I was chatting with them and they had offered me a three-month contract that was no money at all, but they needed a lot of help. It was a really small team. And I was like, I think maybe they would let me do more interesting stuff. And it's not like I had a financial safety net. I didn't. It was like very much a bad objective decision, but I took the three-month contract at the startup over the full-time PR gig. And they did let me do a lot of cool stuff. And then they raised 20 some odd million in a series A like a few months later. So they gave me a full-time role. 
And so for your first job, did you actually get the offer at the PR company? I did, yeah, and I didn't take it. That's a pretty ballsy thing to do on your first job, to have an offer and to turn it down for another offer. It's kind of like an advanced maneuver. I feel like someone at some point had told me, I think it was actually Drew Dudley who became a mentor later, but I'd heard him say, optimize for learning, go where you're going to learn the most when you're young. Cause like either way, you're probably not going to have any money. So who cares? Like go where the things are most interesting. And so that's probably silly because I had to pay rent and like, it was very hard to do that on my salary at the tech startup. But yeah, I optimized for learning in that. I love that. I actually did this on my first job too. I had a job offer and I turned it down and I accepted another offer and I thought I was crazy, but you got to follow your heart and that's what you do sometimes. Yeah. You got to find spaces where you like, I was like, I literally graduated from grad school and was like, I'm still completely useless. Like I know nothing. So I need to go where there are smart people who will let me learn stuff. And yeah. And the team at Wave definitely were that. All right. So, you know, I want to dig into some of the speed bumps in the journey here. Let's take this moment to zoom out and let's talk about a challenging moment that you encountered earlier in your career. We're talking about just starting your career. You're saying, I turned down this offer. I took this other offer. I'm optimizing for learning. I'm just getting going. I am learning. The company raised a big round. I'm in this great position now. Tell me about one of the challenging moments that led to some personal growth. When you first asked me this question, I was like, did I send an embarrassing email to a lot of people? Like, what did I, what did I do? And the thing that kept coming up was at an early startup that I worked at, I was in my early 20s. And you know how startups are, which sometimes they're like, oh, we grew too fast. Oops, we have to shrink the team. And so we had a day where they took half the team out onto the deck and fired them. And the rest of us were in this big room that we all worked in. And it was kind of hard because like none of us knew who had been laid off and who hadn't been. They took us into these two rooms, told us what would happen, and then we all came back together, which from an HR and organizational standpoint, very bad idea. Hold on. Can we pause for a second? <laughs> How many people work at this company? Oh, I think it was probably 80, 80 to 100 at that point. And so there's 80 to 100 people. You're all in one office and then the office has a deck. Can you just kind of set the scene a little yeah, bit? Yeah. There's like a big, beautiful deck and there's two big rooms that we worked in. Gorgeous space. Really great company, great leadership, but like going through a lot of speed bumps yeah. and laid off about, I would say half the team. My memory's fuzzy and memory's not great. So maybe it was 30% or something like that, but it was significant. What was like the catalyst to some people going in one place and some going in the other? Did everybody get a meeting invite and some was to the deck and some was to conference room B or whatever? Is that essentially what happened? Yeah. It was basically you either got the deck invite or you got the main room invite. And so are people talking about that in the office? Or are you like, hey, did you just get invited to this thing? No, it happened really quickly. It happened so quickly that one of my friends was in the washroom and missed it. Like it was like invite happened, done. And she came out of the washroom and half the company had been let go. Oh my God. Okay. So what happens next? So I interrupted you there, but I wanted to explore just what was going on and sort of the context of it all. <laughs> I feel like this is what happened with a lot of the Zoom rooms in 2020. Like it just... Depending on where your invite was, that was your fate. So the kind of poorly handled administration part of this is like, we're all friends because we've been working at this tiny startup together for so long. And we're all in our early 20s. So it's like a super social spot. So everyone had been fired and everyone who hadn't been fired, we all went to lunch <laughs> together. And so the people who are fired, they have to leave from the deck. Do they go back into the office to get their they stuff? Came, they is all came back in. So it was a big flood of people back into the main room. And we still don't know who's been let go and who hasn't. So people start packing up their stuff and leave. We all go to lunch together. And the thing that I remember from that is I'm probably 22, 23, maybe. And I'm one of the only women. I'm one of three or four women who work at this company. And so we're at lunch and one of the guys who I considered a friend and who I'd work on on hackathon projects, we'd pull all nighters at the office, like we worked together pretty substantially. He said very loudly in front of the team, the only reason Sarah wasn't let go is because so-and-so wanted to expletive her, <laughs> sleep with her, which wasn't true. I didn't know that necessarily at the time because I was 20 and I was humiliated and horrified, but I was a really cheap employee who was very effective. I just wasn't on the chopping block. There was no reason to let me go. But in the moment, all of your colleagues are hearing this declaration from this very angry who you think maybe is a friend of yours, say this in front of your team. That's like a TSN turning point moment in my early career. How did that feel? I've always been 
like a little bit of like a, my, my husband calls me a fire gecko. They're like, which Disney princess would you be? He's like, you would be the fire gecko from Frozen that runs around setting fire to things. So I'm like not a wallflower and in no way was I even then. But when you're in your early 20s, you just don't have the thick skin. You don't have the like ready comeback or like the thing to say. You just panic in the moment. And I remember walking back to the office with a friend of mine who was lovely and just crying and raging <laughs> all the way back. And there's that like little doubt, right? Like there's already imposter syndrome. Like I'm 22. I don't feel like I know anything. I'm being paid nothing when I'm working so hard. And I'm working with engineers. Like I'm working with mostly male engineers. Maybe he's right. That's like that, like, ooh, that like insidious sliver that someone plants in your brain. And you're like, I already didn't feel like I was supposed to be here. Maybe I'm really not. And why was this guy even talking about you? Like, is this someone, well, actually for context, was this someone who was staying or someone who had just gotten let go, but still was at lunch? He had just gotten let go and he was really angry. So he just got let go. He's still going out to lunch with the team. But why, why is he even talking about you? Like to me, this feels so inappropriate and out of line. Like it's crazy to me. How do we even get here with him? Wildly inappropriate. I don't honestly remember. Like memory is so funny, right? This was like 14 years ago. I don't remember the conversation up to the point in which he said it. And I don't really remember what happened after. The clear part is him loudly proclaiming this. I'm sure he was probably talking about like why some of us were let go and why some of us weren't and decided to use the fact that I was a young woman as a vessel for his anger. So what happens after this? So you rage walk back to the office. Do you say anything? Do you just let it linger? Like what, what goes on then? I filed his name away in my brain. And to be honest, years later, I had a backdoor reference ask me if he should get hired at a company. And I said, I told them the story. Wow, that's crazy. And he didn't get the job in that company. I would for a lot of money. So very possibly the fact that he did this to a 22-year-old 10 years ago cost him a million dollars. The universe kept receipts, man. The universe remembered that shit. Wow. Makes me sleep a little bit better. Like that stuff does come back. But it was more a shift in how I viewed tech and how I viewed myself and deciding that like he's wrong and an asshole, but I also thought he was my friend. So who is my safe community and who is not? And in moments of stress and tension, who has my back and who does not? And so like from there, I was like, okay, I'm going to potentially be slightly more suspicious of some of these relationships that I have and seek out ones that people who have the same experiences that I do, that we can support each other in a more deeper and more authentic way. And I'm going to summarize this using my own words because I want to make sure I, I hear it right. So what I'm hearing you say is after this moment, I was maybe a little bit more guarded about who you let into your circle and who was more than just a coworker. The big takeaway is like, I will never be a card carrying member of the boys club. In moments of stress and tension, the fact that I'm a woman will be used against me by the men that I work with. Maybe not all of them, but I can't trust that it won't be some of them. It sucks that that's how you feel. As a man, it just makes me cringe. <laughs> as, as a person, it makes me cringe. And as a man, it makes me double cringe. It's just there's an extra long ass layer of vetting for the men that I work with. This episode of the show is presented by Churnkey. I spent years of my career focused on acquisition, activation, and converting free users into paid subscribers. But if I could go back in time, I wish that my teams had prioritized churn more. Don't get me wrong, we did the bare minimum, which was trying to reduce failed payments. But working in a high volume, product-led subscription business, I think we missed a massive opportunity to have more impact and drive more revenue that I personally regret. Because even a relatively low monthly churn of 5% means that you lose nearly half of your customers on an annual basis. This is why I am so excited to be partnering with Churnkey to help more SaaS companies like yours tackle churn. Churnkey has a free metrics product that integrates with all the major billing providers and helps you to visualize all those important churn metrics in one dashboard. Things like retention cohorts, cake charts, the breakdown of voluntary versus involuntary churn, gross versus net, revenue versus logo churn, and a whole bunch more. 
And with Churnkey, you can also take action to reduce churn. Their platform enables you to create and launch personalized cancellation flows, fail payment recovery campaigns, reactivation programs, customer health modeling, and they've got AI built in to help you understand the specific trends in your data. Their platform helps SaaS companies like yours save 20 to 40% of subscription revenue that would otherwise be lost to churn and is pretty compelling. Their product is something I constantly recommend to my coaching and advising clients. You can see for yourself at churnkey.co. So transitioning, we said that this was a tough moment earlier in your career that led to some personal growth. And I'd love to explore the personal growth side of it. So you mentioned that it changed the way that you viewed yourself and viewed some of your, especially male peers around you. How else do you grow from this brutal experience? I think a couple of things. At 22, you're very suggestible in terms of what people say about you impacts how you view yourself. And I had to get over that real fast because I was about to work in an industry where people were going to say stuff about me that I didn't believe to be true and that I didn't need to absorb and integrate into who I am. So to put it crudely, like I started giving less fucks, which was very refreshing because I get to decide. I get to decide my worth. I get to decide what my impact is and why I have a job, <laughs> not, not necessarily some angry dude saying stupid things that maybe cost him a million dollars. And... I never want anyone to experience that. So what is my responsibility as I progress in my career and as I build more power? How do I make sure that doesn't happen to other people? And how do I make sure guys like that don't get in leadership positions so they can't have influence over specifically women and underrepresented people? And I think it started to build the scaffolding that does become grow class eventually. It takes a long time. Um, but the, the combination of like, how do you build a community that actually gives a shit about each other, like really and truly shows up for each other, cares about each other, defends each other against the stuff? How do you create your own version of the boys club that I realized I would never get a pass into? And then how do you help this never happen? Like, I don't ever want a 22 year old working at a tech startup to feel like that ever again. So like, what is my responsibility and how do I accumulate power and then distribute it back to folks who might not be able to speak up for themselves in workplaces like that? If there's someone listening to this, who's maybe gone through a situation like this recently, who's in a position where they've been chopped down in whatever way, shape or form that means to them and is feeling some of the feelings that you felt when this happened to you, what do you want them to hear? It has nothing to do with you and you don't have to hold on to it. <laughs> they, they get to have the burden of their own self-esteem issues. Write their name down for later because it's possible that you at some point will have influence that you can then use to make sure this doesn't happen to someone else. And you know, for a little reputation era fun, but trust that it, anything anyone says about you reflects more on them than it ever will on you. And if you can, get out of there. I don't want you to work <laughs> at a place where you have to experience anything like that because there are places where folks are kind to each other and build each other up instead of tearing each other down. And I know that doesn't always feel possible in startup land, but I promise that, that they're out there. I love the way that you phrased that. And I love what you said a few minutes ago. I wrote it down. You said, I get to decide my self-worth. And I thought that was a really beautiful way to put it. Yeah. Some guy, I'll call him Chris because that's his name, doesn't get to decide. Doesn't get to decide that for you. You get to choose that. And so you continue on in tech despite this, right? It's probably some cells in your body that are like, fuck this. I should just go back to skating or go back to the grocery store or get a job <laughs> in a totally different industry, right? I would Oh, I would way. walk by coffee shops and be like, that looks so nice. I feel like every person who works in tech fantasizes about this coffee shop job. Is I this a thing? To, yeah, it's a thing. I've talked to so many people. They all say this. I actually wanted to open a coffee shop. I told one of my mentors who is the COO at a company I used to work at. I'm like, dude, I really want to do this. After I learn all this tech stuff, this is what I'm going to do. And without a millisecond of hesitation, he goes, oh, that's a horrible business, Andrew. Horrible. I was like, what do you mean it's a horrible business? It's like my passion. He's like, you're going to be managing people that are making minimum wage. The second somebody gets trained and is doing a great job, they're going to quit and go to a higher paying job. You're going to be waking up at 4 a.m. for the rest of your life for people who are calling out because they're not at work or whatever. And it's a really low margin, tough business to scale. 
And I just was so chopped down. <laughs> oh man, as an entrepreneur, like I look at service-based businesses and I'm like, like service industry businesses. And I'm like, oh my, that's the hardest possible path. I'm so impressed. And I, I don't want to touch it with the 10 foot pole, but I'm, I'm so impressed. So you have some urges to go do something completely else, work at a coffee shop or whatever, um, but you continue on in tech. And so I'm curious to know, well, I can guess this is not your only low point. And so I'm curious to know if there's another time where you felt like you hit a major speed bump in the journey. Yeah, for sure. I think there's this myth in tech and kind of everywhere that the amount of effort, the amount of hustle that you put in is equal to your success. And it's a myth. Unfortunately, that's not true. And I think I, the, one of the ways that I learned that, I learned it in a lot of ways, because I was like, the input is the output. How much I work and how hard I hustle is going to be how well I do. And so I worked really hard. And I was working at a tech startup, FinTech. I was running a Canadian growth team. And I made myself very indispensable. I was very in the weeds. I was very in control of the team. I was waking up at 4 a.m. to check the analytics, let's see how we did overnight. Like I was really too much focused on the growth of the country. And there came up this opportunity to kind of GM the country instead of the growth team. And I really wanted it. And I had made myself too indispensable to the growth side of the business to give more leadership. There's probably other factors, but it was offered to someone on the team that I felt did not deserve it. And I was definitely an asshole about it. <laughs> like I was, I was not in my healed leadership era. I was in my selfish personal hustle era. And I learned very quickly that I guess two things, one, making yourself indispensable to a role makes it really hard to give you any other role. And two, it's not about you. If you are going to grow in an organization, it can't be about your personal ambition. No one cares. No one gives a shit that you want the title or the promotion or how hard you're working. What matters is how you distribute value, make people around you better, make the organization better as a whole and work as part of a team. And I was okay as long as I was leading the team and that was my team. I was good at shielding them and I was good at growing them, but I wasn't thinking holistically. I was thinking quite selfishly and quite ambitiously. And it probably held me back from a leadership position for a couple of years. And is this the tension between specialization and generalization? Like if we think about roles and for your value, is that kind of what you're hinting at here? I think so a little bit, but also like if you're really good at your role operationally, it doesn't mean anyone wants you to be a leader because they want you to keep doing the thing that you do really well. So like the specialization, I think a little bit. And then the second piece is you need to widen out your aperture and understand what the people in leadership are worried about and how you and your output is leveling into making their lives easier. Because I was very focused a lot of the time because I've run large communities very focused on the community and the health of that community. And I would have a really hard time seeing it in the big picture of the business and how the output of the community I was building impacted the business and how me trying to shield the community from things like, I don't know, paying more for the thing would impact the business. So try to think of yourself as part of a, the greater team and think of how does this business survive versus how does my, my little thing that I'm trying to grow survive. Yeah. You know, what's really interesting. I feel like for a lot of us, especially people who don't come from entrepreneurial backgrounds, nobody really explains that. Maybe you have an onboarding or orientation meeting when you first start and you have like that one meeting in the week of a million meetings where they kind of explain how the business works. And then that's kind of it for a lot of people, especially high powered ICs. And that's a bummer that that happened. So how did you work on this skill? Oh, well, I became a business owner. <laughs> and then I kind of looked <laughs> back on my career and was like, damn, I was probably quite annoying. And like, I think probably right in a lot of ways in the things that I was trying to do, but not thoughtful in how, what are the challenges the leadership is potentially facing? Like they're just trying to get everyone paid every two weeks. And why would I make that harder by resisting increasing margins? Yeah. The other thing that you touched on is also really interesting. Something I've been thinking about a little bit recently, which is if you work in growth for long enough, eventually to keep growing, well, you get into the work as an IC, I feel like, because you're optimizing for the user. But then at some point, 
You have to optimize for the company. And that might actually mean causing pain for the user. And so the job becomes something where you feel this like big resistance, which is kind of what you're getting to here a little bit with the community and charging and monetization. And that's hard. Yeah. And I see it like on my team now and I'm grateful for it. Like I have Hannah, who's an absolutely incredible leader at Grow Class, is very protective of our community. And I'm so glad that she is. I'm so grateful for that because she cares and she cares about these people and she knows them deeply and she knows them well. And it's a bummer sometimes that I have to think about the business and not just about the people because I wish I could think about the people all day, every day. Yeah. So you were saying you came up in the hustle era of SaaS. That's how I actually describe Corporate it. Corporate feminism, baby, girl boss. Because <laughs> that's how I describe it to people. I'm like, oh, I came up in the hustle culture era where I feel like my first couple of promotions were just because I worked longer and harder and yeah. maybe a little bit more passionately compared to some folks around me and that got noticed and that got rewarded. And I don't know if that's good or not good, but that was what it was when I first got into the space. Um, and there were times that that totally impacted my mental health. And so mm -hmm. I'm wondering if there's been other situations in your journey where this push to hustle and this internal drive impacted you negatively. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Like there's a period of time where there was so much pressure on our teams from our board and our investors that I was getting into the office at 730 I would get on the streetcar at seven. I would get into the office at 7.30. I would have a large McDonald's coffee, like a liter of coffee. And I would stay there until like 6.30 or seven. And then I would go home and I would think about the business and I'd wake up in the middle of the night and check our data. That's not a sustainable pace of doing anything. And so eventually I started having the beginnings of the side effects of burnout, right? And for me, because I have diagnosed anxiety disorder, I started having panic attacks and like I'd had them in grad school. I'd had them before, but never to this severity. The one that I remember the most was literally outside of a hero burger at King and Bathurst in Toronto. And I thought I should call an ambulance. Like that's how much it felt like my chest was caving in. And I was literally like on my hands and knees out front of a bench and I had to get to a partnership meeting. And the worst part is like I, I went to the meeting. I called an Uber and I like crawled into the Uber and I went to the meeting, which like is just red flags on red flags, right? Like if you're having a panic attack that severe, you shouldn't be worried about anyone but getting yourself healthy. And I was very worried about getting to that meeting. And so they, they just, you know, continued to escalate until a full burnout that required me to quit my job. I'm sorry that this happened. To be honest, I was literally out at drinks. There was like a growth drinks a few weeks later after I had quit my job and Tiff De Silva and Alex Chapillo, two of my growth friends were there and I didn't know them very well. And they were like, what's going on? Why what you're consulting now? Like what's going on? And I was like, I burned out so hard <laughs> that I couldn't get out of bed. And everyone, basically everyone at the table was like, Hey, yeah, I did that last year. It's not uncommon at all. Yeah. In this Working profession. in tech is hard. This happened to me, different details. It happened to me during the meeting. There was like a meeting that I was in where I was doing a quarterly, it was a quarterly business review, which is like reviewing the previous quarter and planning for the next quarter. I was in front of the room. I was at a burned out period. I didn't eat breakfast. I had a massive cup of coffee and I was giving my presentation, which my manager had told me he had already aligned with the rest of the execs on. So I thought it was just like a sort of a lip service alignment meeting for the rest of the team. And it wasn't that. And all of a sudden I started getting intense pushback and pressure and why didn't you do this? And how long did you evaluate this other opportunity? And can you tell us the pros and cons of this opportunity that you put up here versus this other one? And the room just started speeding up on me. And I had a panic attack in front of the room as I'm standing up, going through all those feelings on the inside. Can you describe for folks who haven't had this happen, just like what it feels like and what goes through your mind when you have a panic attack? To be honest, it, I don't know if anything is like the, your mind is racing so much that it's like hard to pinpoint anything. But for me, and I don't know what the feeling is like for you, but that would be terrifying in front of a group of people. It feels like the Hulk is like hugging me, like in the tightest bear hug. It feels like my chest is caving in. And I also get like really excellent heart palpitations at the same time. So like heart racing, chest caving in, mind racing, like monkey mind to the point that you can't calm it down at all. What happened? Well, so the thing with panic attacks is that they're really intense, but fairly short lived. And so for me, I was up there, the feelings that come out for me when this happens are my body will feel cold. 
I'll have mm. a hard time focusing. Like my mind will speed up and stop being able to process in the way that I typically can. And then I describe like no one knows. Nothing looks outwardly different, but on the inside, I feel like I want to cry. I feel like I might cry at any moment. I feel like I might die and that I can't breathe. And I just try not to fall over. That's sort of what yeah. goes through my mind. And so when all this was happening, my manager, it was probably in front of a room of 40 people. Like it wasn't a small oh my room. God, that's a big room. Yeah. Yeah. In front of a big room. And so when this happened, my manager who was running the meeting and I was presenting my section of the meeting instinctively saw what was going on, stood up out of his chair and stood next to me. And I don't know if he could tell because he knew me well. I never told him that I had a panic attack. I just tried to play it cool later, but he could tell that I was flustered and uncomfortable. And he stood up next to me and he sort of shielded me a little bit. And I'm forever grateful for that. And then I sat back down in my chair after my, the next six minutes were up and I tried to just gulp my way through them. And then I sat back down in my chair and pretended to be engaged for the rest of the meeting. And I told my friends who were in that room afterwards, they were like, oh, that was like a really intense few minutes. And I was like, yeah, I, I had a full on anxiety attack. And they were like, oh, I had no idea you played it so cool. And I was like, I don't feel cool. Things are not cool. Yeah, that's an incredible boss. It truly was, yeah. And so for you, you have the panic attack before the meeting. You still go to the meeting. How did you feel in the meeting? Like what happens when you sit down? Are you looking around the, are, well, first of all, are you running the meeting or are you a participant? I don't remember. That's the thing that's so interesting is the actual details of the meeting were so unimportant. It didn't matter if I was there or not. I don't think. I don't remember what it was. I was in an agency. They might have been trying to get money from us. Like it wasn't important. It didn't matter. And like, I think that's the thing that I've learned too, is like the things at work that feel so important and stressful, you don't remember the details a few years later. That's how little they actually do matter in the long run. And so for you in the moment, this meeting was so important that instead of going to seek some medical help or maybe just go home and relax if this has happened before and you know how to self-manage it, you went to the meeting. But like literally you can't remember the details years later, right? But I in don't the moment, think it was important. Right. But in the moment you had to go. In the moment. And like, and I think that's so common, like now, especially with, with grow class, because the, the altitude sickness of being a founder is wild. Like you are constantly on a roller coaster of everything is great. Everything is terrible. Everything is great. Everything is terrible. If this terrible thing, I'm not going to remember the details of in five years, it can't be that terrible. So I should just go back to sleep. <laughs> it's like sort of the thing that I always try to tell myself. Have you ever worked with a coach? Yes. Oh yeah. Like part of the burnout healing journey was building a team to support my mental health. So yes, coach, therapist. In my burnout journey, I did like yoga during the day with all of the folks on maternity leave and retired folks. It was, I spent a lot of time kind of building up systems to take care of myself because no one teaches you this stuff. We should learn this instead of the Pythagorean theorem. We need to learn how to take care of ourselves. And like you kind of do need someone to teach you if you didn't grow up learning it. I'm asking because when I first started uh, working with a coach, I would bring challenging situations from time to time. And she would ask me to do a visualization where she has me visualize myself 10 years from now with all my dreams coming true, the success and the abundance that I picture in my mind being my reality. And she'll say, become that person. Now look back on this situation. Is this a big part of the journey or is this just a small blip? And I'd be like, no, I don't think the 10 year version of me even remembers this. And she'd go, great. So let's let it go. And that I had to learn that I didn't know how to do it because I did what you did. After this happened to me, I was kind of shook for a minute and I was like scared that it might happen again. So I was skittish to present again and sort of questioning, well, if I can't present, who am I? You know, it fucked with me a little bit. And so I'm curious if any of that happened with you. Yeah, I think to be honest, after that moment, I kind of went off like a cliff into like straight burnout. So like I had started having the panic attacks, they became more frequent. And then I went into kind of the apathy period of burnout. So like if Folks listening have never burnt out before. There's like a couple of stages to it. And the one that is the most important to, obviously it's important if you're having panic attacks, but like the one is very, one is very important is like you stop caring and you go into kind of almost like a professional depression. Um, that is when like you, you got to stop. 
So I, I did, I was sitting across from a therapist and I was explaining that like I was struggling to get out of bed in the morning and I didn't, I just didn't care about things that I cared about specifically to do with work, but kind of generally. And she's like, you got to quit your job. You have to Wow. Your, your therapist said that. Yeah. Like you have to quit your job. You're past the point that we can just manage this while you're working. And so what do you do now if you feel yourself starting to rev a little bit higher? We talked about learning some strategies to self-manage this. For folks who are listening that are still learning to manage, what's something that works for you? So one of the things that I find incredibly helpful is getting back into your body in some way. So I'll do like a wall sit if I can get out of my head and back into my body. So I'll like run my hands under really cold water. I'll do a wall sit. I'll do push-ups. I'll get outside and go for a walk. Changing temperature helps a lot too if you feel yourself going into what could become a panic attack. Breathing exercises help a lot. I find the physical stuff helps me even more. Um, if I can do a combination, that helps me quite a bit. But I've also now, with Grow Class, designed a work environment where like it just doesn't come up that much anymore because I close my laptop at five. I don't open it on the weekends. I take a, a proper amount of vacations. I know that none of this is brain surgery. Like literally, there's a guy in, like, there's a guy in my workspace whose job is literally brain surgery. Like, no one's going to die if we get this wrong. None of it is worth panicking at four in the morning or giving yourself that much stress or anxiety. So you talked a little bit about the guardrails that you put in place to really design your lifestyle to be more suited for your overall health. So you talked about not working on the weekends, signing off at a reasonable time, taking vacations. Are there other things that folks who have the privilege of being able to design their own life or their work around their life should think about? Yeah. Like nine to five is a manufactured thing. It's for the turn of the century when we were working in factories. One of the reasons why we drink espresso and not coffee is so that we can go get back to work faster. It's a smaller, more concentrated version. In the modern workplace, doesn't have to look like that. Like you don't have to work from nine to five unless you have a nine to five. So sometimes I'll feel guilty for jumping on the Peloton in the morning and not starting until 10. And then like, where's that guilt coming from? Like, why does it matter when I start and when I finish, as long as I do the things that are most important and I get to choose? And so it's the same with my team. I don't care. You don't have to sit at your laptop from nine to five. Just get your stuff done. And I don't care where you work from. We're a completely remote team. One of my team members is at a cabin right now working kind of whenever she can. That's where I want to work. So that's the place I want to design for the, the people that I care about to come work at. Has there been a pivotal moment or person that has positively impacted your career journey? Yeah, so many of them. Can I say four people? <laughs> Because I, I, I have a group that I'm part of that we call the Faux Workers. And we all started businesses kind of around the same time. Hold on. The group's called the Faux Workers? Like F-A-U-X? Yes. So around 2017, we were all either like a year into, I was a brand new baby consultant. Some folks were a little bit further into building their businesses. And I went to brunch with Melissa Nightingale. And she's the co-founder of Raw Signal Group with her husband, Jonathan Nightingale. And I said, you know, I really like this designing my own life thing, but I'm so goddamn lonely. Like I miss Slack. I miss coworkers. I miss like gossiping at coffee. Like I just, I miss the social interaction part. And she said, you said the magic words. And she invited me into this group. And these folks are just incredible people, incredible business owners and have shaped the way I think about building a business. And I'm just like, wildly grateful because I call them friend tours because they're friends, but they're also people that I like look up to with giant shining eyes. They're just wonderful leaders in tech and in their own spaces. And so it's um, Melissa and Jonathan Nightingale, Christina Hug, and Avery Schwartz, who's the founder of Camp Tech. And just, I would have gave up about a hundred times without that group. And is it a mix of tactical and emotional support? Is that kind of the yeah, gist? Have, yeah. We have like four hour board meetings <laughs> once every couple of months and we bring our hardest problems and we go through them together. But then there's also the social side of just like having these people that you care about and trust kind of on call for whatever it is, fun memes, interesting articles, stuff to gossip about, but also the really hard bits that you don't really talk about with anyone else. Yeah. I found that having that support 
I wouldn't have made it to the point that I've made it to without that as well. I've got a similar group, all folks who are like kind of solopreneurs. So people that aren't necessarily building large teams, but are out on their own trying to monetize their experience and their audience in different ways. And I find the emotional support. It's like picking you up when you're having a bad day, when you're having a great day, sharing some of the wins and the learnings with other folks to bring them along with you and just not building alone. Because it's hard and lonely if you're building alone all the time and all the problems seem heavier than I think they need to be. So that's really cool that you've got that. I'm wildly grateful for them all the time. And so if we could go back in time, what is one skill that you wished you worked on a little bit sooner and why? Oh, writing and communicating what I was doing and the worth of the work. So I think early days, especially when I first started managing in growth, I was really good at the work. I wasn't really good at showing leadership, what my team was capable of and what my team had produced. And that made me a worse leader. When I started honing writing ability, I became much better at telling those stories and much better at advocating on behalf of the people that I worked with. And I think what I wish I had known as a young person is it's like, what you do is important, yes. How you talk about it and how you can contextualize it for other people is almost as if not more important. And the people who can do that are the people who rise and who lead and the people who can't end up just doing all the work. And you don't want to be the person at the end of the day who gets stuck doing all the work with none of the credit. So to find ways to communicate the worth of your team and advocate for the people that you are leading and make sure that they get their flowers. That's such a great answer. That's actually probably the number one thing that I recommend to folks who I coach or who I mentor, because they all know that they all hire me thinking, hey, I need to learn something that I don't know yet. And what I typically will work them on is translating what they already know for non-native speakers. And if you can't do that, you can't get alignment, which means you can't get resources, which means you can't get good work done, which means you won't be impactful and you probably won't be in that job for long. And so I thought you articulated it beautiful. And I see the same thing when I work with folks individually. Oh, good. Yeah. If you don't have access to, I, I've called it in my brain a lot, like generational information. Like if you don't have people who are mentoring you or in your family who have built businesses or have risen through the ranks and in, in tech or in corporate roles, you just don't know how to do that. And no one teaches you how to do it. And usually you learn the hard way. And I just don't want folks to have to do that. So we do a lot of work in grow class teaching folks not only how to do the work, but how to build the confidence to communicate the value of what they've done and how to consistently show up and communicate that clearly to folks who might not understand marketing. Oh, I love that. And on that note, can you give us, for folks who are listening to this, there's probably a ton of overlap and interest in what you're building at Growth Class. Can you tell us a little bit more, just the TLDR and where folks can go if they're interested in learning more? Yeah, absolutely. So Growth Class is a six-week growth marketing course. So if you ended up in a role and you're like, hey, no one trained me for this. I did a post-grad in marketing and none of the shit I'm supposed to know was included. No one, no one teaches this and it's much easier and better to build and have a career if you have someone who shows you how to do it and then also connects you to a network. Um, The people part is the most important. It's really, you know, it's good to build your confidence and to build your skill set with the hard skills that we teach. The thing I'm most excited about and find most important is the network. We have 1,500 folks and like, Sometimes when people are like, we have 5,000 people in a Slack community, like it doesn't mean anything. There were 192,000 messages sent in Grow Class last month. It is very, very much a community. It is very engaged. Folks are, are very much here for each other. And we provide a ton of structure around building your community and your network and feeling connected to folks when maybe you're working alone in your basement all day. And you don't necessarily love your coworkers or you don't have good relationships with them. So we become your team. That part is why a lot of the folks that join Grow Class and and on average, women who graduate the program within 60 days have a $26,000 salary increase. That goes up for racialized folks and LGBTQ folks. So we not only are very good at teaching the hard skills, but we're really good at helping build confidence and network to help you get into either a better role or a promotion at your current role or to quit and do your own thing because a lot of people do that too. Oh, that's awesome. And for folks who are listening that want to connect with you or learn more about you, where, where should we send them? Where should they follow you? What social platforms are you the most active on? 
Yeah, I've got a big following on Twitter. You won't find me there. <laughs> so come hang out with me on threads or Instagram. I'm SK Stockdale. Perfect. We'll put a link to all that stuff in the show notes below. Thank you so much for coming on and being vulnerable and sharing your stories. Thank you so much for having me. 